Good afternoon. Welcome to yet another extremely topical and riveting AMET webinar. Um, as most of you know, over the last several weeks, a string of explosions have been rocking Iran. Um, and uh, we are um, almost certain that it has set back um, Iran's nuclear program. We're not sure how, for how long um, and whether or not this damage is irreparable. Um, but we do know that um, it is making a very significant dent. Um, here to answer these questions about, you know, why these mysterious bombings or attacks are coming, going on, um, why they are necessary, are two of the world's most prominent experts. Um, David Albright is the founder and president of the Institute for Science and International Security. Um, he is a physicist who directs the work of the Institute and is published in several journals including the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, Science, Scientific American, Science and Global Security, Washington um, Quarterly, and Arms Control Today. Um, the research reports by um, David, David Albright and um, his institute have been published by the Environmental Policy Institute and Princeton University Center for Energy and Environmental Studies. David has co-authored four books, including The Groundbreaking World Inventory of Plutonium and Highly Enriched Uranium, um, and written um, um, a second greatly expanded edition entitled Plutonium and Highly Enriched Uranium, World Inventories, Capabilities, and Pol Policies, and he's co-editor editor and contributor to challenges of facile material control. Um, we, um, during his career, David has testified numerous times on nuclear issues um, before the United States Congress. He's spoken to many, many groups, technical workshops and conferences, briefed government decision makers, and trained many government officials in nonproliferation policy making and strategy. Um, he is frequently cited. Um, the National Journal profile in 2004 called him a go-to guy for media people seeking independent analyses on Iraq's um, weapons of mass destruction programs. Um, and those of you who have been with us know that Afraim Embar is no stranger to our AMET seminars and webinars. Um, Ephraim is a long-term wonderful friend of Annette. He is the founder and president of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. Um, and he has um, been in charge of the Bessa Institute. He's been a visiting professor at Georgetown, Johns Hopkins, Boston Universities, and a visiting scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Um, the truth is that if I were to read um, both of the bios of these illustrious gentlemen, we would be on the webinar for our entire allotted time. Um, but first, I have got to apologize. Both of our, um, our uh, esteemed scholars are out of the country. Um, and um, for David Albright, the connection is not what it should be. So he is just going to be able to talk to us about the spate of um, bombings um, without um, a, a visual. Um, so it'll just be auditorially that we'll be able to get his wonderful information. So David, will you bring us up to date about what's been going on in Iran? Well, thank you very much. Yeah, and I apologize. No apologies necessary. As for the internet. Mm. David? Mm. David, I'm having, we're having a bit of a difficulty hearing you. I think we should have a frame to the introduction do you want to talk now? about the, Talk about um, what's being what's being discussed about this in Israel. 
Well, uh, in Israel, uh, we don't discuss uh, too much uh, this type of uh, operations. Uh, I think that uh, everybody in the world believes uh, that this was uh, uh, the result of uh, uh, the Mossad work in uh, Iran. And uh, in any case, uh, you know, I, I'm sure David uh, could have given us all the details of the extent of uh, uh, the damage to the Iranian nuclear program, but uh, uh, it's quite clear that uh, uh, some damage has been done. Uh, I'm not sure it's irreparable, you know, they, have, they are in for this program for a long time and they've uh, uh, had setbacks, uh, partly a result of uh, the doings of others, partly a result of their own doings. Uh, in any case, uh, if I have to look at what happened, I can say uh, uh, two things. First of all, that uh, Iran, uh, despite their security services, is vulnerable. And uh, things can be done in Iran uh, without uh, the authorities uh, being aware of what's happening. Uh, this is, uh, of course, important. Um, and uh, a second observation that uh, what has been happening uh, reflects an ongoing relationship between Iran and Israel. Uh, and uh, I think that the two countries are uh, bound to clash uh, because of two basic uh, regional dynamics. The first one is uh, the attempt of Iran to gain hegemony in the Middle East. And uh, the second dynamic is uh, their uh, nuclear aspirations. Uh, and I'll try to say a few words about those two dynamics and afterwards to speak about the Iranian-Israeli context. Uh, the Iran is a large country, a big country in Middle Eastern terms, you know, uh, 80, Five, 90, 000, 90 million people. It is uh, a relatively rich country uh, because of its oil reserves. It is uh, technologically advanced. Uh, it has an imperial uh, past. Uh, and since uh, 79, it is uh, a revolutionary state uh, trying uh, to uh, impose uh, its version of uh, Shia on, on the Middle East and maybe beyond that. So uh, this is a hegemonial drive. They try to export the revolution. And of course, we see their presence all over the Middle East. I'll say a few words about it later. The second uh, dynamic is uh, their progress on nuclear, uh, on the nuclear path. And it's quite clear to me, uh, and I'm not, uh, you know, I think that part of the world uh, is quite naive about it. They want a bomb. And they are working uh, to get a bomb. They, it's a technologically advanced country. They can do it. Uh, they want, uh, the motivation is also clear. They want a Shiite bomb. There is a Sunni bomb in Pakistan. They want a Shiite bomb. Uh, it complements the hegemonial drives. They'll be able to project power and uh, uh, coerce uh, neighboring countries uh, in order to attain uh, their national goals. And uh, I must say that uh, the Iranian nuclear effort is primarily defensive. It's not uh, offensive minded. It wants uh, basically uh, one thing, to ensure the uh, survivability of the regime. Uh, they look around, uh, North Korea was spared uh, an American attack despite, uh, you know, the American uh, uh, <clears throat> attempts to bring about democracy to the whole world. Right, North Korea yeah, is a different story. Libya was attacked by the West after it gave up its nuclear program. Uh, so uh, their understanding is that if you have a nuclear program, uh, maybe you can be spared a, a Western attack. Uh, don't forget, it's two neighbors. Iraq, as well as Afghanistan, were attacked by the United States and invaded. Uh, so they believe that a nuclear bomb 
may give them some measure of um, uh, defense against uh, Western uh, intentions. Uh, it's more difficult to destabilize, it's more problematic to destabilize a nuclear uh, country uh, because you don't know uh, who is going uh, to push the button uh, after you take one down one regime. Uh, this is uh, uh, probably one reason nobody deals with Pakistan, for example, which also is not uh, a paragon of democratic virtues. And still it was spared as a crusade, the democratic crusade of the United States. Uh, so they want uh, to, uh, to survive. Uh, also, in order to try to uh, acquire uh, some of their uh, goals, hegemonial goals, they developed also a missile program. Uh, they have long range missiles, thousands of uh, kilometers, in order to uh, project power, first of all, in their immediate region, and uh, they can also threaten uh, uh, parts of Europe, uh, India, for example, which is, uh, people do not always realize that India is much closer to, to Iran than Israel. It's just 300 kilometers. In our case, it's over 1,500 kilometers. So uh, this is uh, the motivation of the Iranian uh, nuclear program. And uh, I think uh, it was uh, the wrong policies adopted by the West, be it the JCPOA, which did not prevent progress uh, nuclear progress in Iran, uh, also the sanctions. Despite the uh, great effort to uh, impose uh, economic costs upon Iran, uh, maximum uh, you know, economic pressure uh, of this uh, administration, uh, the Obama administration before uh, signing the JCPOA, uh, the Iranian uh, regime continues to uh, try to attain the bomb and to uh, be as short time as possible, uh, what we call breakout uh, from uh, a, a nuclear bomb and a nuclear arsenal. Now, in the, if we take a look at the Iranian-Israeli relations, we should be aware that for Iran, that is, you know, radically zealous uh, Islamic entity, Israel is a religious operation. In their uh, religion, according to their religious doctrine, there should not exist a Jewish state, simply. And I don't think they are bashful about saying it again and again. Uh, I, I really uh, wonder that the international community uh, seems quite blasé at the repeated statements uh, of one member of the international community against another member of the international community. Uh, so uh, we take this uh, threat quite uh, seriously. And uh, uh, Iran wages a war against the people of Israel, not against the IDF, not against the military. Their strategy is quite clear to try to uh, exact a cost from the Israeli society, uh, hoping that uh, eventually uh, the Jewish state will wither away. Their belief, like uh, you know, uh, Hezbollah and others believe that Israel society is weak, cannot withstand uh, a prolonged uh, conflict, uh, particularly if they are uh, um, subject to repeated missile attacks, and eventually the Jews will give up their state, their leave, or whatever. This is their view of how the Jewish state will disappear. And indeed, they try to surround Israel uh, with launching pads for missiles. It started with Hezbollah in Lebanon. Lebanon is, of course, a fully uh, colony, a full colony of, of Iran. Uh, they uh, did the same with, in Gaza. They started with Hamas. Uh, Hamas was not uh, cooperative enough, uh, and they uh, now support the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. 
and they have other organizations as well. In Gaza, that are directly supported by Iran, and in what the Iranians are providing, apart from some money and uh, light arms, they provide missiles, missile technology, uh, in order to shoot at Israel missiles, to fire missiles at Israel. This has been uh, repeated in Syria. Again, we see, even today, uh, Syrian, uh, in Syrian controlled area, uh, ir pro-Iranian mil militias, uh, be it, uh, you know, Afghanis or uh, other, you know, uh, maybe uh, Shiites from uh, uh, Syria uh, that try to entrench themselves in Syria in order to make Syria a launching pad. And at this stage, uh, Israel uh, conducts a war against this president. This is what we call the, the campaign among the, uh, between the wars. Uh, it's kept uh, at a very low profile, uh, but once in a while we hear uh, uh, the chief of staff, a former chief of staff, spoke about over a thousand missile atta uh, attacks on uh, Iranian targets in Syria. And all the time, according to foreign sources, uh, we hear that something is happening in Syria. Uh, the fact of life is that Israel is at war with Iran. And uh, of course, this might escalate uh, into a larger scale war. Uh, we see also uh, Iranian attempts to gain a foothold in the Palestinian Authority. Some of the, uh, we just found out a few weeks ago that uh, one of the Democratic Fronts is basically funded by Iran, again, in the hope of uh, making uh, this uh, organization uh, a launching pad of missiles against Israel, very close to us. Uh, I live in Jerusalem. Uh, Ramallah is just 10 kilometers, I think it's six miles from, from my home. Uh, Israel, in Israel's view, uh, this is an existential threat. For the Iranians, destroying Israel does not always only uh, function as a religious uh, duty, but also in order to attain their hegemonial war, uh, goal. As the United States leaves the legion, this is a plan already from the Obama administration and Trump continues with it. Basically, what is left in the Middle East is Iran, is Israel. Only Israel can really stop Iran and the Muslim, Sunni, what we call moderate states, uh, are fully aware of it, and this is why they impose the relations with Israel. Only Israel is fighting literally Iran, and only Israel can stop Iran from ruling over the whole Middle East. This is why uh, there is also a strategic imperative from the Iranian perspective to destroy the Jewish state in order to attain their goals. Uh, Israel is very concerned about the Iranian nuclear program for several simple reasons. Uh, Israel is convinced that uh, there is no defense against uh, missiles uh, armed with nuclear weapons. We do have a defensive shield, but some, it's not foolproof. Uh, we are talking about over 90% uh, interception rate, but even uh, if we leave uh, five, 10 percent, if it if the situation is uh, uh, missiles with uh, nuclear bombs, this is a, a very risky situation for Israel. So there is no defense, and Israel is convinced also that there is no deterrence. It's very uh, difficult to emulate the situation that was between the Soviet Union and uh, the US in the Middle East for many reasons. And I can give you another lecture about it at another time. Uh, moreover, deterrence is dependent upon sensitivity to cost. 
This is why we believe that rational actors are not willing to pay a very high cost for uh, starting a nuclear war. But Iran uh, is a different story. The Iranian leadership said openly that they are willing to pay in millions for destroying the Jewish state. So there is no defense, there is no deterrence. Therefore, we cannot sit idle as the Iranians progress on their nuclear program. And so far, Israel, and it's a well-known secret, has tried to uh, slow them down. We've seen the Stuxnet uh, you know, virus. Uh, we see all the time uh, um, scientists uh, end up their life earlier than planned. Uh, we see uh, what happened uh, recently you know, in, at Natanz, at other places, Parchin, at other places, that uh, uh, accidents happened and there are fires. Uh, so we try to slow them down. But the policy of Israel historically has been very quiet, very clear. We are going to preempt. We preempted the Iraqi nuclear reactor in 81. We preempted the Syrian nuclear reactor in uh, 87, 97. And uh, probably this, what will happen also if the Iranians get too close to, uh, to the bomb. Uh, I have advocated a preemptive attack since 2005. So I think we lost a lot of time. And as time goes on, things become more difficult. Uh, but this is probably uh, what uh, will happen. And uh, I'll stop now on this happy note. And yes. <laughs> I'll, I'm ready to take questions. Uh, let's, I think we have David by audio. Um, I'm sorry we don't have him visually. Um, David, do you want to just um, give us your wizened opinion of just how, how far set back the nuclear program is as a result of these attacks? Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. And let me, one thing I, I would like to do is just provide a little bit of context to um, some of the situation on the ground in Iran. Um, and it, it's a little bit more in the weeds than you've just heard, but I, I think it, it would be, it's, I think it's important to discuss some of this. Um, one, of the, one of the things that's clearly happened and we're all aware of is U.S. has stepped up a lot of pressure on Iran and um, through its maximum pressure campaign and, and essentially crippled the Iranian economy, but it has not resulted in, in new negotiations. And I don't think there's much expectation that during this term of the Trump administration, the negotiations are going to start. Um, you also, you have that with the revelation of this nuclear archive that Israel managed to seize in Tehran, you have a tremendous amount of new information that was given to the International Atomic Energy Agency in order to pursue it's, it, let me just call it, it's long-term interest in understanding has Iran declared all its nuclear materials and, and nuclear activities in the archive information led to the answer being no. And it also led as a result to the IAEA asking to visit two sites um, that were previously part of this pre-2004 nuclear weapons program euphemistically called the Ahmad Plan, um, and they, IA has evidence that those sites uh, had undeclared nuclear material, namely uranium, um, or undeclared nuclear activities. One was involved in the production of uranium hexafluoride and other uranium compounds. Um, the second one was involved in experiments of developing nuclear weapons components that very well involved uranium. And, and that, while these are historical sites, historical events, the IA is simply asking the question, where's the uranium today? 
why is it that Iran didn't fully declare its nuclear program as it's required to under its, its what are called its safeguards agreements? Iran has reacted very defensively. I mean, it throws out everything's forged. It throws out, you know, you have no right to do this. It relies on its ally, Russia, um, and, and increasingly now China to try to block the IA, undermine their efforts. And, and it appears to have reached a bit of a stalemate. The Board of Governors um, had a vote in June, and the vote was overwhelmingly for uh, Iran to let the IA in. And, and this could escalate over the summer to where the board is, is willing to send the issue to the Security Council. But again, there's not a lot of hope that Iran's going to let the inspectors in. Um, and it gets right to the core of one of the problems in the nuclear deal, which was that while the declared sites in the nuclear deal are pretty well inspected, um, and the, in fact, there's some innovative things going on, the, the parts, the undeclared activities and sites are poorly inspected under the nuclear deal and, 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 and it's reached ahead with the, the recent request of the IEA. Meanwhile, Iran is building up its nuclear program. I mean, it is, it's, it's said it's not gonna abide by the nuclear limitations. Um, while the number of centrifuges have only modestly increased at the, uh, in total, the Iran did restart the Fordow enrichment site. It's now enriching uranium, and the Fordow site has special significance. It, it was actually ordered to be built under the old Ahmad plan prior to 2004. It's where Iran, and this is shown in the archive, was going to make weapon-grade uranium for nuclear weapons. It continued after the, the end of the Ahmad plan, the, the, and, and the plant was finally discovered by the by Western intelligence and shut down as a nuclear weapons production site in 2009, and then placed under um, IA inspections after Iran denied it all and said, no, 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 it was never part of a weapons program. Um, but again, the Ford House site is active again, it's, and it's very deeply buried and very hard to destroy. Um, Iran is rebuilding up its stock of low enriched uranium. It's reached uh, an amount that allows the breakout timelines to drop significantly from the JCPOA breakout timelines of 12 months. And now in a worst case, Iran within three to four months could produce enough weapon grade uranium for, for, for its first nuclear weapon. As it increases its stock, it'll get enough for a second. The second can, tranche of weapon grade uranium for a bomb can be made more quickly than the first. And so you, you have pressure building that Iran is developing its nuclear weapons capability. And this is against the background. It's a little bit chilling that if you study the archive and at my institute, we've been trying as much as we can on a unclassified basis. Um, and I've, um, in fact, we're writing a book on the archive and spending a lot of time trying to understand the documents. But one thing that's very clear, and I think you'd hear this clearly in Israel, is, is that Iran knows more about making nuclear weapons than we thought prior to the, the discovery of the archives. And this is deliverable nuclear weapons. So the time it would need to take that weapon grade uranium, turn it into bomb components, develop, let's say first a nuclear test device, and then a deliverable weapon is just faster than what people thought before. And I guess, in a, and with that background, I think you have to then look at, at this, what appears to be an attack on a nuclear site. I mean, again, I, I have no idea um, if it was or not. Um, we can analyze it and, and we can, and we've done that with commercial satellite images and our reports are on, on my institute's website. Um, the building was, essentially destroyed. It looks like it was a single point explosion. We, in trying to figure this out using commercial satellite imagery of various quality, we think that there, there may have been a gas pipeline into the building and that the explosion happened kind of under the building. But, it, but again, it's, it's hard to believe that the gas pipeline accidentally blew up. I mean, it's possible. 
but it's a it's a very large um, explosion that that caused tremendous damage in the building, and it and so you're 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 left thinking that perhaps it was an explosive device and the and the impact was magnified potentially by by a gas explosion. This site is also um, is very um, important to the Iranians. I'd say it's part it's a crown jewel of the Iranian gas centrifuge program. There, there was a, a video of, of, of an Iranian news story from June of 2018, soon after President Trump decided to uh, relieve the nuclear deal. And, and, it's, and it's about this site. And, and it's in the context of a, of a site very important to the Supreme Leader's goal of reaching what he called in a speech, reaching out what's called 190,000 swoop. I mean, what that is, is it's a huge amount of enrichment capacity. It's the amount you need for a very large nuclear power reactor. And, and it's way beyond what you would need in a nuclear weapons program. But if you can achieve that kind of enrichment capacity, on the surface, it could be civil, but you could use one twentieth of that capacity to make enough for nuclear, make enough weapon-grade uranium for nuclear weapons. So it's you could, in essence, hide a nuclear weapons program in this vast civil enrichment program pretty easily. And this site is a, is is shown in in this video of this news story as sort of the crown jewel of that effort. And what what is that? What is this site? It's a place where you would do the final assembly of advanced gas centrifuges. So the parts would be made other places, but all these parts would come to this, this site at Natanz, and you would, you would do the final assembly, which involves quite a bit of balancing of parts and then some, some tricky uh, assembly of the components together. A centrifuge is a very high precision um, instrument. And so you would also do all this within a clean room, which and the clean rooms you can see in the video. And so, um, and what's unique about this plan is that it was created to make, to mass produce these advanced centrifuges. And so in essence, to be able to make several thousand a year. And I don't think they have any other facility anywhere like this. And so by taking this facility out, if it was an attack or and let's say a slight chance it was an accident, it's created a serious bottleneck in the Iranian ability to mass produce and deploy uh, advanced gas, gas centrifuges. And, and just to fill in the story a bit, these gas centrifuges would be things that are called the IR2M, the IR4, uh, not the big fancy tall ones that they sometimes like to refer to, the IR8 or the IR, and there's even an IR9. These are these, um, in a sense, simpler of the gas, advanced gas centrifuges that, that do work better than the traditional one they've deployed in the past called the IR-1, that these tend to work about four or five times better in terms of their output. May be more reliable, may not be, but if you can build thousands of them, then even if 20% a year break, you can still build up quite a capability of advanced centrifuges. And, and this accident or slash attack has pre is in essence preventing Iran from being able to do that. We would we we're estimated at the institute for at least a year, maybe longer. It, it takes time to build clean rooms, um, takes time to gather all the equipment that you need, and takes time to just organize basically a construction project and getting it going. So I think it in that sense this this uh, this event buys some time, and. It doesn't eliminate Iran's ability to deploy centrifuges. They have quite a few stored of these IR1s. They have about a thousand IR2Ms that were deployed prior to the uh, nuclear deal. And, and under the nuclear deal, they were put into storage. And so those could be redeployed if they don't need this site. So, so the bottom line is this activity isn't gonna stop Iran's advanced centrifuge R&D, uh, it's not going to stop deployment of a certain number of IR2Ms, but it, but it does stop the ability of Iran to meet the goals of the supreme leader to have this 190,000 
swoop or your capability. It stops their ability to build thousands of them um, and then deploy them. So, so I think it it is a, it's it does off, offer an opportunity, um, and we'll see if they you know, if they quickly try to rebuild or or um, well, we'll just see what they do. And, and in fact, that is certainly one of the big questions is, is will Iran retaliate? And, and one of the things we found in, in our research that was interesting is um, the Iranians are not looking to, um, to hype up this episode. I mean, if you look at the record, they first they denied it happened. They show they may admitted something did happen at this building. They finally admitted what was going on in this building, and and then then they showed um, the least damaged side of the building in video. I mean, our initial analysis was based on that damage plus some some very um, crude satellite imagery. They are having trouble getting high resolution at that point. Um, but clearly, the Iranians were not trying to to um, hype this up and and demand retaliation. And I think. Part of that is is that um, you have to think of what is what is the motive. Let's say if this was a deliberate attack, and it knocks out a crown jewel of the gas centrifuge program, sets them back. Um, what happens if Iran then says we're retaliating and then strikes out militarily? Which which again they could do, but if you're a military planner in that nation that did this, assuming it's a nation then that opens the door to severely damaging the rest of Iran's centrifuge program. And I think one of the goals would be to destroy Fordow, destroy the rest of Natanz. So I do think that in this, I would expect the Iranians to be very careful how they respond because this attack that was done, if again, if it was an attack, didn't kill anyone. It, it knocked out a facility in a centrifuge program that has no economic value at all. I mean, Iran will always be able to, to obtain low enriched uranium for as many nuclear power reactors, as many civil reactors as it ever wants. So what is, so if they're gonna make their own enriched uranium, it's gonna be at a much higher cost than what they could simply buy it. And so it has little real value. Uh, as a facility in any kind of civilian economic model. So I think it, if now Iran retaliates militarily, it, it will open the door to potentially quite a severe military response. And I'm not sure how much the world will care in the sense of, of real outrage that it would take place. Um, certainly there's a lot of worry I'm, I'm in Europe, there's a tremendous amount of worry about war in the Middle East. Um, but I think but one of the things that's been interesting here is, is that, that there hasn't been a lot of condemnation of this um, explosion. I mean, one is, it is hard to figure out who did it, but still, there hasn't been a, uh, a rush to judgment that it, that it was Israel and then, a, and then a quick condemnation. So I, I do think that... Um, it's opening a door, as Stuxnet did, to a different kind of warfare, and and I think we'll, we'll it's very risky, and we'll see how it goes. Um, but it, I think it, if it is an attack, and I, I think again, I think we would probably probably say it is an attack. Um, there's a lot of frustration among. Um, that I sense in countries like Israel, um, people in the United States, that that see an impossible situation where the only options are, you know, increased pressure, hope for negotiations, and Iran, on the other hand, just building up its nuclear program, lowering breakout timelines, um, be in a sense preparing itself better to build nuclear weapons. And let let me just end that. We can talk about some of the potential solutions, um, but let me just end that. You know, what is an Iranian nuclear weapons program? I mean, we now know from the nuclear archive what it 
was in the early 2000s. Essentially, it was a crash nuclear weapons program to get five nuclear weapons, four of which would be missile deliverable with the Shahid-3. Another could be tested underground at a test site that they were building. Um, under international pressure, threats of U.S. invasion that they run into quite seriously, they, they cut back the program. The archive also shows that they didn't, they didn't end the nuclear weapons effort. They ended the Ahmad plan, but things continued. And you can see it. One of the sites the IA wants to visit that was part of the Ahmad plan, critical facility in the Ahmad plan, was only dismantled in July 2019, when the, I, I would assume when the, when the Iran perceived the IA was going to ask to go there. So that site actually may have continued either as an active site or on standby for years after, after the end of the Ahmad plan. There's other ones. I mentioned Fordow. Fordow, in our analysis, and again, the studies on our website, it's mostly from interviewing IA inspectors who went into Fordow soon after it was opened up by the Iranians. That site was to make weapon-grade uranium in 2009. That was the intention of the Iranians. That effort was squelched when Western intelligence discovered it and imposed, ins, imposed sank, um, inspections. But it, again, it continued. They wanted to build it after the Ahmad plan. So what do you have? You have a program that probably is not an active program like it was pre-2003, but you have a program that's probably preparing itself to make nuclear weapons. And part of it is safeguarded. Ford Owl is a safeguarded facility under IA inspections. So is Natanz. Um, but they're critical parts of it, of this nuclear, of this preparatory program. There are secret parts, parts that, that really don't have a good explanation on, in any civilian way, run by a person named Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, who was also the head of the Ahmad plan and he continues to run an operation out of the Ministry of Defense in Iran that has all these constituents and all these people that look like they're working on things related to nuclear weapons. So ultimately the question is, how do you prevent Iran from activating this plan um, to build nuclear weapons? And, and let me just end it there. I think it, it, it certainly has to involve negotiations, but I think we're entering an era or it's going to involve some of these non-standard ways of trying to interfere in a program and to, to truly set it back. Thank you so Thank much. You. Okay, um, I'm going to take the liberty of asking the first question as the moderator. Um, we know that there are two models. There was the 1981 ASARIC model um, where, um, um, Israel did not inform um, the United States, and my dear late friend, Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick, told me the worst day of her professional life was when President Ronald Reagan called her and, to the, and said that she had to, with, in no uncertain terms, excoriate the state of Israel um, for blowing up the Asarak nuclear reactor in Iraq. And she said she knew that she was going to live to eat those words. And of course, when we did go into Iraq, she, she did. Um, and then there was the Stuxnet model, which was very much, we suspect, um, in coordination between Israel and the United States. Um, in both of your wizened opinions, do you believe that this was done in coordination with the United States? Yeah, let me, let me, this is David. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how, mm -hmm. I mean, Mark Dubowitz was, was on your webinar right. a couple of weeks ago and he raised this, 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 this kind of U.S. pivot to China um, for the U.S. military. And, and mm -hmm. it brings up this issue of, you know, is the United States looking for Israel to do more against Iran and to do some of these kind of non-standard um, apply some of these non-standard methods. Um, but it, I think it, I, I would think the U.S. doesn't really want to know is what I would guess, but, but the Trump administration is a very different type of administration than the Reagan administration was. It was a very different kind of action. 
to bomb a reactor that's safeguarded operate or nearly operational versus taking out um, a critical facility in a in a centrifuge program that most people didn't even know existed. I think if we hadn't published a study on that site in 2017, 2018, people wouldn't have even known what that building was. The, the Iranians don't advertise. In fact, the mm -hmm. Iranians even came, there were statements by Iranians that, you know, how clever this was, and put, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but I think they were surprised that, that it, in a sense, it was a very surgical operation to take out something of value, where the Osark reactor bombing was more a blunt force um, mm -hmm. attack that may or may not have set back their nuclear weapons effort. Um, mm -hmm. we, that's a separate discussion. Right, right. Um, okay, Sarale, do you want to open up the floor for questions? Yes, thank you so much. And thank you to our panelists for sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom. We have a lot of questions, but as usual, unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. But thank you to everyone who has submitted a question. We'll get through as many as we can. Um, so our first question, how close is Iran to a nuclear bomb and how close are they to reaching the ability of fitting it on a ballistic missile? Um, this might have been touched on, but this is one of our more pressing questions for either uh, Ephraim or David. Uh, from do you want me do you want to go first or you want me to so you are uh, better at the technical but uh, okay i would like to point out that uh, if there are differences uh, of opinion uh, i so i would uh, advocate my government uh, to uh, work on a worst case analysis yeah and and i think what what where we we're we're thinking about it a great deal. I mean, it, it's and, and the Israeli intelligence agencies or government have put out estimates. Um, what when we looked at um, based on what we knew of the archive and and where Iran's getting in terms of being able to produce weapon grade uranium. I mean, what what we concluded and it's. And again, it's just us at the Institute, and it's not even a worst case, is, is that within a year, Iran could test a device underground. It, it has done work on tests, developing a test site. It may, it may choose to do a tunnel rather than a, a, a deep shaft, but that it's scoped out areas of Iran where it could do these tests, and, um, and, it, and it has the capability, certainly, within several months to cobble together a test device. How quickly could they develop it for the Shahib 3? I think it's a very difficult question. Um, I, I, and in some sense, we query other, we query governments and we get a variety of answers. I mean, one in Europe, um, a year or so ago said they thought that Iran would need about three three months. You know. The Israeli intelligence people put out information in public that they thought it would be longer than a year. So, so I think it, it's, it's very hard to get to the issue of, of actual weaponization, but, it, but we are talking order of a year, perhaps longer, perhaps less, but it's, it, um, um, it's less if they want to test. And, and why does that matter? If you look at other countries, um, let's take North Korea. What changed the North Asia situation dramatically was when North Korea tested in 2006. We have no idea if they could have deployed um, a warhead on a missile then. Certainly would have been a shorter range one than what they plan on now. But it, it wasn't even clear then. Their 2006 test didn't work very well, yet it, it shook the world. And I think it very well may be that that the discussion on how long to build a deployable nuclear weapon is is important, but it's probably more important if Iran decides to build nuclear weapons of, of when it would test. And that is measured more in months than a year or two. Thank you so much. Um, for our next question, this could perhaps begin by being answered by Ephraim. 
Do Israeli defense specialists believe that Israel can eliminate most of Iran's nuclear installations by itself? Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, we, uh, actually, uh, the chief of staff um, just uh, ordered a new command to be formed, which is the Iran command uh, to be headed by uh, Air Force General. Uh, and uh, I quote him, his job is to wake up every morning with the only job of how uh, to prevent Iran from getting a bomb. So, uh, uh, you know, as it's quite clear to me that uh, we can do it. Uh, you know, uh, I'm just a, a private, but a paratrooper. And, uh, you know, from my experience, if you are uh, uh, determined uh, and have uh, some ingenuity and ready to take casualties, there is not such a thing as an impregnable target. So, uh, yes. It's, it's a political decision, basically, uh, to, uh, and uh, Israel faced, you know, this uh, moment of truth, uh, according to what uh, was published uh, in, in 2009, uh, and uh, then the decision was no. Uh, I think uh, the decision might be different, uh, but it is finally, you know, in, a, a political decision, and uh, the Israeli forces, uh, the Air Force, and probably some special forces uh, will be able to uh, carry out uh, attacks on uh, the vital, you know, uh, installations of the Iranian nuclear program. Okay, um, I think we might have time, Sarleya, for one more question, and then... Sure, thank you. So for our last question, um, to either of our panelists, do you think that a probable Biden win in November would influence the timing of an Israeli decision to conduct a preemptive strike on the Iranian nuclear infrastructure? Um, it could. Yeah, do you, Afran, you want to go first? Well, I... I, I... From what I read, uh, you know, uh, the Trump administration gave us a green light. Uh, but, uh, you know, with the Trump administration, you never know when a green light turns into a different color. So uh, <laughs> I think that uh, a Trump administration is more uh, uh, willing to accept uh, such an Israeli act than, than a Biden administration. Um, but. Uh, it is not our choice, you know, it, you, the Americans will choose their president and will have to live with it. Yeah, and it, it's also, it's worth remembering that Stuxnet happened during the Obama administration. It was, it, it was mm -hmm. the, the same idea. It was less effective, I think, than, than this destruction of this um, uh, assembly building at the times in terms of setting back the program. This was, but it, it's still the, the effort to set back the program, I think, is is a genuine uh, desire in the U.S. government, and I don't think the Biden administration is going to run to rejoin this nuclear deal. I think it it sees what's. I think there, the administration. Let me just predict. Um, understands that the sanctions have prov provide tremendous leverage. They've worked. Um, Iran is not just um, building back up as if it's in retaliation for Trump leaving the deal. It's also continuing what amounts to a, almost a two decade effort to trick the International Atomic Energy Agency to, to not allow them access. Um, and it's also, it's trying to learn more about making advanced centrifuges and that, that is, in a sense, irreversible. So I would I would predict that the Biden administration will be looking at a renegotiating a, a negotiation of this nuclear deal, not a return to the to the pre May 2018 situation. And in that, they're bound to be looking at at methods that don't cost any lives, 
that can set back the program. And it and I think one of the um, developments since let's say the Syrian the bombing of the Syrian reactor in 2007 um, is a greater appreciation for understanding secret nuclear programs and how to hurt them um, with minimal use of force um, and minimal diplomat minimal diplomatic fallout. Uh, Thank you. That uh, Biden administration is probably uh, more uh, willing to uh, have illusions about diplomacy and, uh, and sanctions. Uh, so, uh, and uh, it is a pity that uh, uh, this type of uh, uh, ideas uh, still uh, uh, float in the American uh, decision makers uh, circles, uh, despite. Uh, uh, that every fact shows that it doesn't work. And we are now in 2020. Right, okay. On that sanguine note, I'd like to just say a few, uh, a few closing remarks. Um, it's amazing how an existential necessity um, creates this uh, tremendous motivator. And we see what's going on. There's this period of American retrenchment after our long military engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan. And you know, in Israel, they have a phenomenal expression, Ambrera. There's no other choice. It's survival. Um, we're hoping um, that um, David is correct, that there's going to be some lessons learned from um, our sorry experiences with the JCPOA. Um, but there is, I see, a big tendency um, to want to always, always revert to diplomacy and negotiation, even when you're staring at the face of evil incarnate. Um, so I cannot thank um, the two of you enough for your wonderful wisdom. We could be talking all day long. I'm sorry, we just have one hour. Um, but I, I, you're, what you bring to the table is, is for both of you, is just wonderful. Um, and thank you for your um, contributions to the survival of Western civilization as a whole. Um, please tune in next week. We're going to have Akon Erdemer from the Foundation of Defense of Democracy, who was a member of the opposition of the Turkish parliament at one point talking about Erdogan's, um, um, what his, his designs are in the Middle East. And thank you once again for tuning in for just another wonderful um, Annette webinar. And David, can you just tell the name of your website where we will be able to see the pictures of what has been done recently? Oh, yes. yes, it's www.isis dash online dot org so it's isis dash online dot org essentially we're the we're known on the, our tweet twitter handle is the good isis the good isis right <laughs> we'll get David all bright and they'll find it all right right <laughs> uh, thank you both um and um we'll be in touch very soon okay okay thank, thank you very much okay you thank will you. bye bye